board meeting of December 4th. Um, just a couple of internal things to get started with. We have uh, one bill, uh, what did I do? For W.D. Mason for $72 and change. Did I lose it already? Here we go. Uh, $70 and 32 cents for envelopes. Uh, that is the only bill schedule that we have. Anyone wants to look at it? Um, if there's any discussion, if, if there is no discussion, um, I'd entertain a motion to uh, approve the bill payment of $70 and 32 cents. Seconded. It's been a motion and second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Um, we have minutes for December 13th, uh, for November 13th. Uh, I don't know if folks have had a chance to look at them. I have not. Okay, so we'll either table that till uh, the end of tonight or uh, to our next meeting. Um, um, not real bright, but my sense is that there are some people here for um, a special permit. And I'll have an announcement for that in a minute, but uh, let me read the um, the advertisement and notice that went to a butters in accordance with Mass General Laws Chapter 40A, the Zoning Act, Section 9, Special Permits, and, spe and Section 11, Notice for Public Hearing, and and the Norton zone by Zoning Bylaw, the Norton Planning Board will hold a public hearing on December 4th, 2018 at 715 in the Norton Town Hall Selectman's Meeting Room, 70 East Main Street, Norton Mass, on the special permit application submitted by EMA Group LLC, 11 Blue Heron <coughs> Lane, Southeastern Mass, to the Norton Planning Board on November 7th, 2018. The site is located at 1 Mary Jo Road, Assessors Map 36, Parcel 114-01, in the Residential R80 Zoning District. The applicant is requesting the planning board issue a special permit to allow for use of a group home or for special needs children. The application, plan, and supporting documentation is on file in the office of the planning board and may be reviewed during working hours, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, 8.30 a.m. to 4.30 p.m., <coughs> Thursday, 8.30 a.m. to 7.30 p.m., and Friday, 8.30 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. Any person interested or wishing to be heard should appear at the time and place of the public hearing. Um, is the applicant here? Ah. Yes, sir. Application withdrawn. Right, we're gonna withdraw it. That's for the record. Could you just come up and state your name and? Sure. and My uh, name is Eli. Can we for the microphone, please, sir? Mic, please. Eli, yeah. Good evening, everyone. My name is Eli Abuke. I'm the owner of EMA Group LLC. Uh, we decided to withdraw the application. We are not going to go, uh, Judge Rodenberg, they're not going to be tenants in that area. Okay. On that premises, so. Okay, so the application has been withdrawn. Yes. I have a question? Uh, yes. Okay, I'm, I'm one of the abutters. I was just curious, what uh, would you be willing to share with us what your plans are for those properties then? Those properties both will be for sale. Okay, do you have any anybody you know, on target to sell them to? Uh, no, that's, uh, you know, it's, I haven't put them on the market yet. Okay. But eventually they'll be on the market. And uh, I cannot right now tell you, answer your question, who's going to be buying those properties. Okay, thank you. All right. Thank you. But uh, as everybody's concerned, the application was for Judge Rodenberg to uh, lease one of the properties, and we decided not to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. All right. The application has been withdrawn. Um, there is a process whether it, sh it can be the withdrawal can be uh, that ex that withdrawal can be accepted with prejudice or without. Um, I, and <clears throat> I'm a little I was not prepared for this piece, this part of it, but an application that is withdrawn and ex that withdrawal accepted with prejudice allows the the uh, the board to. Uh, revisit the issue under the terms um, that it was originally submitted on, in case it does come back. Um, so I don't know if, if the board wants to simply allow it to be withdrawn or allow it to be withdrawn with prejudice. You, you may have some uh, 
you're closer to the uh, the the, the uh, legality of, of the, that type of an issue. Well, I think having at this point, if having it all already been advertised and submitted, I think it does have to come back to us to accept the withdrawal. Right. And I think given the the publication of it and the response, I think it would be appropriate to accept it with prejudice. That's my point. Is there a motion uh, to that uh, effect? So moved. Seconded. There's been a motion to accept the withdrawal with prejudice. Uh, there's been a, and there's been a second. All in favor of that motion signify by saying aye. 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 I too will vote aye. Thank you so much. Thank you. And, uh, you're welcome to Have stay. Have a nice evening. Thank Bye. you. You too. Uh, so that that issue is is uh, is not going to be certainly dealt with tonight, uh, nor perhaps in the future. Yes, ma'am. Can I just ask one quick question? Certainly. I was told that the other two properties in um, Norton did not require a special permit. So is there now that this special permit is being withdrawn, is there any way he can go through with this without applying for a permit? I certainly wouldn't, wouldn't want to you know, offer him or anyone else advice on what they can or can't do. There is some question as to whether a special permit is required. Uh, right. I'll be candid. Um, thus far, uh, both at the building and, uh, commissioner's um, level and the Board of Health level, uh, they've had issues just with compliance with building and or health codes. Um, and they weren't going to take any action until such time as the planning board acted on the special permit. Uh, so, again, I'm only assuming what's going to happen going forward where the planning board is not going to be taking any action. They will um, uh, deal with those <coughs> issues, i.e., the septic system and uh, the the building code compliance as if it was a typical single family home. Um, again, whether it needs a special permit or not, we took the approach, or I shouldn't say we, you know, Paul and, and um, others um, took the approach that it was better to err on the side of caution and require a special permit and require the applicant, if they were going to go forward with a Rottenberg Center, um, to place the burden on them as to how they qualify for any exemptions. Obviously tonight without the hearing, uh, we never got that far. Uh, but again, you're right, there are others in town that did not require special permits. Um, and that's a gray area to be perfectly candid. Does this have required a special permit because it's uh, uh, on non-essential road? It's it's uh, not accepted, road. No, that wouldn't have any bearing on it. No bearing. No. Uh -huh. no. I mean, the intent, and, and again, the philosophy behind the, some of the laws that that would have allowed um, the uh, usage of, of that or other facilities uh, without a special permit is that the the intent is to treat them like any other home. Um, you know, I'm sure you folks have moved into homes and no one required special permits of you. And that's the intent of the law, but you have to qualify for those exemptions. And the jury's still out as to whether that center would have qualified. Just one question. Certainly. So what happens if they, uh, they move forward with, as a residence and they get their septic approved and their building approved, and then after it's all said and done, they try to rent it or lease it back to? Same. Party. So the same party or a different party, then it, what happens then? It would be a. It would be an issue. I, I mean, I, I, I'm, uh, again, not, you know, well versed in, in this. Doesn't happen all the time, um, as as has been mentioned. There are other facilities in town um, that that's exactly what happened. An existing house was bought and uh, it was utilized. Um, given the fact that this is on the radar screen, so to speak. I think that would be a little more difficult to accomplish because you'd still then want to initiate certain inspections that wouldn't typically be initiated for someone buying a house. But um, I don't, again, I, I'm out of my element when I start to opine on those types of things. How would you know 
if they turned around and leased it again? Right. How would you, how would the town right. find out about that? Or could you? Because I suspect that may very well be what they're going to do. Well, you don't know that. Well, I mean, it, again, uh, it would be a little more difficult under <clears throat> these present circumstances as opposed to having built the house and just quietly uh, gotten an occupancy permit and then, um, you know, leased it out. Uh, I don't know that there would be anything that uh, any more than, uh, I'm trying to think if, if you know, you or I decided to take in borders um, and we kept it quiet, um, who's going to know and what's going to initiate it? But there's no, there's no trigger mechanism once yeah, the that, occupancy that per uh, permit is issued. So uh, again, under the circumstances, given that uh, people are well aware of this as a, has been a, a possibility in the past, it'd be a little difficult going forward, but that's, that's not to say it couldn't happen. I was going to ask one other question with that tonight. Obviously, everything that happened here, we've got that recorded and so forth. Does that have any bearing on, let's just say they come back and they, they withdraw this, yet go ahead and, um, and, can, and rent this out to Judge Rottenberg Center? What? And we find that out later. Do we have any recourse tonight, or is it just basically this is a legal tactic? Well, here, here again, I'm, okay. I'm certainly not an attorney, okay. and I'd, I'm, you know, uh, more comfortable dealing with certain other sure. planning board uh, topics. This has, has never come up uh, as, as long as I've been a, a member of the planning board. But um, again, we've we've accepted the withdrawal with prejudice, so we ha we haven't um, in essence blessed this. And okay, that's what I was getting at. Yeah. Um, and we would still take the position whether or not um, he applied for a special permit that he'd require that he would re be required and given the fact that he had already filed for one and right. uh, we've in essence protected our rights by accepting it with prejudice I think we're in, on a little better ground but again that's what attorneys get paid uh, sure. a little more than I do <laughs> uh, sitting here um, so uh, I, I don't want to give anyone a false sense of security or, or alarm so okay. that's that's but at least That's, we'd still have a basis to... Well, we'd still have a basis under any circumstance, um, provided they do not qualify for certain exemptions. Uh, and again, the, the reason we took the approach of requiring a special permit, we felt that they did not qualify for those exemptions. Um, and it would, the burden would have been on the applicant to demonstrate that they did. Uh, we didn't get that far. Okay. Yeah. I would also assume their initial occupancy would be as... Um, as a single family residence. Right. If that were to change, they may not broadcast it, but certainly if it became known to the community, uh, <coughs> they would have to question their use of their occupancy permit right. and come back to at least change the occupancy permit, whether it comes back to us or not. Right. It doesn't really comply with what they've, they've sold it for, right. they, they've occupied it for. Right, and, and that's what I was kind of getting at. So when you did that under pressure, <clears throat> it gives us at least the opportunity to come back and kind of go through this process again. Yeah, we don't know if it will come back this way, but at least I'm assuming their occupancy permit would be for a, a single family residence. Excellent. If they're using it for something else, whether or not they're allowed to or not, they still need to get a permit for that use, okay. I would think. Okay. So what about the other two properties that already exist? I don't Are know. Those they would. Being questioned or like Again, that's is not. Is it just <clears throat> grandfathered or? I, I, I don't want to give bad information. Um, uh, I don't know the particulars of those those uh, particular uh, uh, locations, whether in fact they qualify for certain exemptions that would allow for that type of use or not. I don't know. And I, I, again, it would uh, it would <clears throat> probably fall. To, I mean, it, it could fall to a number of different agencies, be it Board of Health, be it the Building uh, Commissioner, be it uh, something else. What agency would you talk to in town that would give you the answers like the gentleman That's asked? Right. Is it the legal counsel that represents us for, this, for the town? Well, again, if the issue... It's not the planning board. It's, there's got to be an agency we can go to and say, Correct. I, I have an occupancy permit, but how do I put 16 kids in my home legally and staff and get away with it when I have a system for a four-bedroom house is there somebody? Well, here, here again, I, I mean, if, I mean, it, 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 
there's a, there's a continuum if, um, again, we mentioned septic systems, if the, uh, the center or the, the, the entity only had four children uh, and that's all they were using in terms of water and septic, then you know, the, the Board of Health may not have jurisdiction. If in, let's take my house or your house, all of a sudden we've got 16 un unrelated people using a septic system, then the Board of Health would have jurisdiction to come in and say, hey, you, know, you're, you're, you have the potential of, of contributing to, to groundwater contamination. Um, but until it happens, I mean, there's no, as far as I know, no preemptive way of saying to someone, any one of us, that you, know, you can't take in uh, or you can't have 10, 12 people in a, in a house. Uh, there, are, there are requirements that they be related. So you, know, you could have you know, three generations. Uh, in, in my case, I could have, if I brought in all my kids and grandchildren, I could have you know, 18 people living in my house. Uh, and we'd probably all qualify as, as family members. But the Board of Health. Have staff. These people, they have, there's a lot of staff in those. Places. No, I, I understand. And, and again, I, 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 I don't want to. And I, I understand this, this issue is important to you, and, and, and I'm not minimizing that, and I'm certainly not saying it's not important to the planning board, but to be perfectly candid, I, for one, and I don't know if anyone else can speak on the, on the board, I feel a little unqualified to answer some of these questions. I just don't know. Um, and to the extent that we wrestled with this particular issue, this particular application, and, you know, it's... I don't want to say it's resolved itself, but at least for the moment it's resolved itself. From a planning board perspective, I'd want to leave it there. Uh, and again, if I were in a position to, uh, with more information and more experience with this, I'd be glad to answer your questions. I just, I've never dealt with this before, so I'm trying to be candid. I don't know the answer to all that. Uh, not in a bad way. Uh, well, yeah, uh, homeowners have certain rights, I'm sorry? We have a, we'll have an HOA there. Yep. Uh, do they have, I guess, if anyone would know, can we uh, put, you know, restrictions in the HOA? That was Again. Yes. I know you would help with that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Just, can yes. I? Just again, I'm I'm not an attorney, but I, I, one thing in researching this is they are a protected class, so be very careful because there are anti-discrimination laws, mm -hmm. and this group, particularly if you're dealing with special needs children, are probably the most protected class. So just that would be something you'd want an attorney to look closely yeah. at. Like just as far as being able to lease your property, period, or rent it, maybe we could put restrictions on that. Yeah, I mean, that, again, that's a private matter between that's yourselves. Yeah, that's yes, sir. Oh, no, I'm sorry. There are exemptions under both uh, state and federal law that for what are classified as educational facilities, and that's the, you know, the definition of an educational facility or a child care facility, um, whether they qualify for that. Uh, for example, Wheaton College is exempt from uh, certain zoning requirements. That does mean we can't look at applications, but they can go ahead and build their dorm, uh, and uh, again, they've got exemptions. Uh, the, Well, again, it's not, it's not unique to Norton. It's, uh, you know, there's every, I don't want to say every community, but many communities uh, have facilities uh, in them, uh, whether it's Rottenburg or others, uh, that qualify for exemptions. Uh, I worked for a town in, in the past that um, dealt with the same thing. Uh, in that case, they bought an existing house and, um, you know, they, they had, the facility had certain rights. Uh, Well, here again, I, 
I'm out of my element. Uh, if, if in fact, they were to um, qualify, the burden would, would be on them to demonstrate that they qualify for those exemptions. And in all due candor, if this thing had gone further um, and they made an argument for a qualification, we would have brought in counsel to, uh, you know, to review their argument. Uh, you know, no offense to any of us, but it's not anything we typically deal with. So. Um, Well, here again, that was one of the one of the concerns of the uh, Board of Health uh, that, in fact, they were not going to uh, um, approve their septic design based on what was intended to be a group facility. Uh, it, I, I don't know this uh, firsthand, but my assumption is that as a single-family home, the septic design was perfectly adequate, and the Board of Health would have been prepared to approve it. Uh, but it, it didn't qualify for a group home. And that's why uh, the Board of Health would not sign off on it pending the special permit, and then it probably would have required a redesign for a larger facility. So if they sold it to a group home anyway, because um, they don't have to tell anyone, I understand. Well, I mean, you know, we, we can all do things that we're not supposed to, uh, and it's the, 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 the that's the key. Uh, one would be, the, the only other one I know, well, you mentioned, I guess both would be on town. Uh, no, not town septic, they're on private septic. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, Again, don't know the design of their system. Um, yeah, I don't think those have ever been presented to this current board, so. No. We don't have any, we don't have any information on those other properties. Nothing's ever been presented to us, yeah, so, I, so I, yeah. I don't think any of us could speak to those two properties. So does any group? And I'm not talking about just the um, you know the Jess Rottenberg, but for any group home in the town, don't they have to go someplace in the town and say we're going to be operating a group home from this address? No. They, they don't have to. Nobody has to know anything. No. That, to be candid, that's part of the philosophy behind, and again, I'm not picking on anyone, but you know, you didn't come to anyone and say, hey, I'd li like to live in Norton. And the, the, the philosophy is that's the same approach uh, or same uh, um, interaction that they should have. Again, that's the philosophy. Um, but you know, if there are other considerations, not the least of which is what we've just been speaking about, is, is septic design. Um, whether in fact the building has to be sprinklered given you know the capa the capabilities of some of the residents um, again it, it's you know it, it, it's a catch-22 if if an entity comes to town in advance and tries to do if you will the right thing they're going to face in, in many cases as tonight some pushback um, so in in other cases, they just, like you or I, just you know, buy a house, move in, and um, by the time you know what's going on, they're established. Uh, but again, <coughs> um, and, I, I, and I appreciate your, your, your anxiety. Um, you just, and again, someone else on the board may have more experience with this than I, but uh, you know, I'm in the same boat in, in, uh, as you folks are that uh, we don't have the answers because this does not happen all the time. Um, yes, this gentleman in the back. And yeah, just a, I know you're not comfortable answering these questions as far as the extent they're going to. Who in the town, where there is someone in the town, could you point us to answer those questions? And I, I don't want to sell anyone short. I don't know that there is anyone. and, and uh, because these types of things don't come up all the time, and, and when they do, if like like in this case, uh, Paul was in touch with town council, 
and um, you know, council advised you know to be a bit cautious. These people have to qualify for the exemptions, but if they do, um, they're in, in essence entitled to move forward. Um, that expertise, because it doesn't happen all the time, I don't believe resides with any one in individual here in town. But um, I, I couldn't. Let me put it this way: I couldn't point you to someone who I know has the experience. <coughs> One other question. Uh, there are two homes, right? And and one is intended or was initially intended for Judge Rottenberg. And it just intuitively tells me that it would be, you know, as an independent businessman to have another home residential after that's in may be difficult for him to potentially sell that home. So the question I'm getting at is it is there anything that restricts him from putting two Judge Rottenberg homes in on that street? No, if he, if he qualifies for so they the have, exemption. So they can have two or they can have four, they can have as many as they want on the same street? All, of which, words, all of which would, from our position, have to come through this process again with okay. the special permitting. And but if they don't, if they kind of learn maybe their lesson this go around and don't do that and just come in and we've got now two homes instead of one, and I've, side by side, that exacerbates literally all those concerns as residents we have with the safety of the street, of the children, of all the other people. So it's critical in my mind. I won't speak for everybody, but I think the fact that they were here, we've discussed the process with them. If were they to move forward without following this process, that would be viewed negatively from our perspective. No, I, I agree. Again, I can't, um, you know, if there's going to be someone tomorrow that walks into the bank and, and cashes a check. I assume they're going to do it legally, but I, you know, I can't get into someone's head and rather than write a check, they might write a hold-up note. I just can't, you know, um, no, we, we, have, I mean, we live there, we'll know pretty quickly. Once people move in, the, the question is do we have recourse at that point? Based on tonight, if this is under prejudice, it sounds like we do have a level of recourse. Well, again, we, right? the, 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 the handle to this is that we have taken the position that that type of facility requires a special permit. Okay. And unless they can demonstrate that they don't, that they qualify for an exemption that um, gets them um, ex out from under the need for a special permit, um, again, our expectation would be they'd be back here and making their case for this is why we qualify for a special permit. And that notwithstanding, they're still going to have to address the issue of septic, building code requirements, and perhaps public safety vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, fire escapes and staff training and that type of stuff. But uh, uh, again, I'm just... No, I understand, but I think when you made the statement about it being under prejudice, it tells me that there's a caveat in there. And well... That, that at least gives us the ability to come back if we have to. Hopefully we don't. Well, again, the, 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 the philosophy behind accepting a withdrawal uh, without prejudice, with prejudice is that we're not saying that they don't need a special permit, and that's why they can simply withdraw. Okay. We're, we're still of the opinion they require a special permit. Yes. My last question, I'm sorry. You're well aware that there are two other properties. Do you plan on going two, after them? Two other properties. I'm a little concerned because just this no, gentleman I don't mentioned. Mean these two. I mean the one on Road and on East Street. Me. I'll speak for have myself. Any I have. Of all of them abide by any specific rules? I view that as out of the purview of the planning board um, because those are established, whether they should be or not. Um, but I mean, like they're breaking all, like, say, the septic rules. I, I mean, I. Don't, I, I want to be clear. I don't. Board. I don't know that they are. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and you know, they may, as we've been. You're reiterating, they may, may at those facilities qualify for the exemptions under the statute and are perfectly legitimate. I have no reason to, to believe that they are not, but by the same token, I have no information as to whether they are or are not um, eligible for the for exemptions. Uh, so I'll leave it to to others. It's not a, it's not something that the planning board um, typically deals with. 
Again, uh, I, I know the one on Shelley Road has been there for probably 20 years. Um, so. Thank you. Thank you. Do we need to close. This no. is a public hearing or no? It no, it was, it was, it was withdrawn. We just, uh, again, accepted that with yep. all the prejudice. So, um, you, again, you're welcome to stay, but we have uh, <laughs> Thank you. another special permit. <clears throat> I think about this. I don't think we're out of the woods. No, there's a reason. Oh, he had more. And then he's just going to come in and do it yeah. without it. Right. It's not how we do it. It's, it's, it's maybe, yeah. The problem is, you know, don't have any definitive Thank information for it. Right. Um, I'm a little concerned with the. Uh, Frank and, and Steve, not there. Yeah. Frank had to, he, his child had a hearing infection. Yeah. Things. I don't know why Steve's not. I haven't. I don't think we have a we, we, we permit. We, we would be voting on this evening. So. No, they, they haven't missed anything as of yet, have they? No. No. Uh, so there's still, I'll leave it to the applicant whether they want to go forward. They'd have to, they'd have to, like I did, watch, watch the, the watch tape. The tape. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I assume they'd be prepared to do that. Yeah. I watched the one, one I missed a while back. But. Can you yeah, hear well? Formally. Like on the tape you can hear good and. Oh, yeah. 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 It's so, fine. Yeah. 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 It's tough to hear the crowd when they weren't at the microphone. Yeah. I know. <laughs> That's always kind of our problem. Yeah. All right. Uh, uh, Fine, Nicole. Thanks a lot. We, uh, we. <laughs> now you're blocking the audience. <laughs> That's fine. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay, so uh, why don't we uh, get <coughs> reestablished? Um, Jeff, just so you know, uh, two of our members are missing tonight. Um, <laughs> My assumption is that uh, they will watch, they can miss one meeting uh, and still participate in the granting of a special permit. But I'll leave it to you whether you want to, again, I can only assume that they are willing to do that. Um, but I, I'll leave it to you whether you want to go forward or not. We'll go forward, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, and let me. Uh, I'm sorry. <clears throat> oh, um, I'm sorry, I didn't. All right. And for the record, I missed the last meeting, uh, and I just want to make two points. First of which, did a great job. I, I did watch the tape, so I want that on the record that I did watch the tape, so I'm, I'm eligible. And had I known. Uh, what we were going to deal with tonight, I might, might have at least missed the first part of, of tonight. And <laughs> <laughs> like it just, Steve. Well, I, I, handle that? I certainly welcome your return, Joe. <laughs> so. Francisco, yes. respond first to uh, their yes. comments. Yeah. All right, so the, I believe um, where we are at, uh, let me just, one other thing for the record, uh, something that's been puzzling me, and um, we are dealing with currently special permits and site plan review, although um, unless someone corrects me, uh, there's not been a definitive subdivision filed. And to the extent that there are no uh, on record separate lots, uh, I don't see how we can 
act on the special permits and site plan review until that special until that definitive subdivision um, is is submitted. You know, I stand to be educated on that point, but uh, it almost seems contradictory that we're dealing with individual site plans and special permits when, in essence, this is one big parcel or two parcels, however it breaks out. So I, I just want to make sure that we're all reading from the same choir music that that is still a piece that has to, to come before we can close and act on these special permit applications. Are we? Okay. Yeah. Again, Mark did with Condine Engineering Group. Um, yes, that is understood. Um, we've received uh, five comment letters now. Um, we're uh, hoping to resubmit site plans that address all the comments uh, tomorrow or within the next two days. And the definitive subdivision plan will have all those changes. So it, that was the, if we submitted a defin definitive subdivision application two weeks ago, it would have just changed as a result of responding to comments. So um, we'll get the formal paperwork in. And um, it's essentially the same set of plans. There's actually a lot more detail on these site plan permit sets than um, typically a, even a subdivision plan would have. But uh, so that's the reasoning for the for where we are at this point was to respond to the comments, um, not submit a set of plans that don't make any sense as we're revising them. Uh, so we'll and we understand the need for that uh, along with the okay. for approval. And in terms of moving forward tonight. Um, Francisco, I, I believe um, you you are prepared to respond to some of their comments to your comments. Uh, is did you want to put anything that's, out on the record b before that or no? That's why I was planning to start with his response. So I, okay, Joe, before you go forward, sure. on the same vein that you were talking about, uh, are we wrapping in the um, the site plan approvals? Because I think that's a shorter time period, and now we've got a new site plan. Are we all rolling them into one one progression? I think there's like 60 days after you filed site plans. When they're filed as special permits, the site plan follows the same path as the special permit. Okay. That's in the bylaw. Okay. And I think one of the trigger mechanisms is the actual closing of the special <coughs> permit hearing uh, that the clock starts to toll. So I think we want to be careful about closing uh, until we're sure that we're good to go. And again, I don't think it would be wise to close the public hearing on the special permits until we have the definitive subdivision, uh, because yeah. otherwise we could run out of time and, and be forced to, I think, disapprove them because they're not separate lots. Any event, uh, Francisco, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much and uh, good evening to the board. Um, we received the response to the comments that we had in our original review from the applicant. And in general, they answer satisfactorily all the comments that we had. Um, I'll be happy to go one by one through all of them for the benefit of the board and for the public as well. Um, one of our first comments was uh, including the intersection of Bird Street and East Main as part of the traffic study. And based on the further discussion that took place at the last board meeting, there was a grant from the board to um, allow the applicant to, pursue, to, to complete the traffic review without having the um, intersection analyzed. And we concur with that um, um, response as well. So there is no further action required for that response. Um, the documentation that we had for the final environmental impact uh, report did not include the uh, manual traffic movements information for the Saturday counts that were obtained uh, as requested by the Massachusetts Department of Transportation on the MEPA uh, process. Uh, the applicant provided us with the count information. We confirmed that the counts are matching the analysis for uh, existing no build and build condition. Uh, there is no further action required from the applicant on that regard. Um, we had a, another comment regarding the seasonal adjustment. There was not 
a clear language in the reports that were provided by the applicant and on the CISOL adjustments. However, we, in our initial review, we concurred that the months where the traffic counts were obtained were showing a higher than average monthly uh, monthly traffic volumes. So they were okay with that. There, uh, it's just a, it was just a matter of having the clarification on the report on the record. Um, the applicant provided that language. Uh, there is no further action required on that specific regard. Um, yet similarly, there, there were some uh, crash data, uh, crash data, um, crash rates that were included in the report without this supporting the computation for the crash. Um, um, how those numbers were developed based on the mass GOT methodology. The applicant provided those crash. Um, data worksheets and they are consistent with the report and the information that was provided, there is no further action that is required in that regard either. Um, there was a, an, I wouldn't call it necessarily inconsistency, but it was a, a question on since the salary volumes were obtained in 2018, the projected volumes were towards only six years instead of seven years. and. Uh, it was inconsistent on how the report was written um, and the clarification that was provided from the applicant indicating that uh, the original volumes that were obtained in 2017 um, were part of the draft environmental impact report. Now, when uh, going through the MIPA process, um, Massachusetts uh, DOT required them to include uh, salary counts on certain locations. Um, they obtained the counts and they projected the volumes to the same year horizon. It was just a matter of how their uh, language was indicated in the report. So that was clarified and there is no further action required on that, on that regard. Um, we had raised some concerns about the uh, potential trip um, patterns, travel patterns that would be affected with the resident hall at uh, Whitton College. Uh, the applicant has clarified that uh, due to the location of where the, uh, the new residence hall is going to be built, um, there is not significant travel changes that will be incurred on um, along 123. So um, with that on the record, there is no further action required on this particular regard from the, from the applicant. Um, we had also a comment in which there was not a clear um, understanding from the report if the uh, pedestrian faces were reflected on the analysis for um, the one, uh, I 495 northbound on southbound ramps. Um, as you are aware, MassDOT has a project in the area that is going to implement some signals. And the um, analysis that was presented by the applicant is we were not um, sure that was reflective of the proposed plans that from us DOT. Um, the way that the analysis is presented by the applicant is actually showing a little more conservative scenario. They are considering the pedestrian faces uh, concurrent, making some of the uh, faces a little bit longer than what might be needed just for the vehicle volume. Um, some of the queues may actually be a little bit longer than what you would actually see once the intersections are improved. Um, so if the applicant was required to revise the analysis, it would actually show a much, a slightly better scenario and the, and the results would not be uh, significantly different. Uh, we, our opinion is that there is no further action required from, from, from the applicant on this regard because even the, the results would actually show um, a much better case than what they are included in the report as it is now. Um, we had a concern about the way that um, some of the flex space was uh, determined in terms of the number of trees that we expect from the generation for, to be generated. Uh, the applicant provided some clarification in which um, how that uh, potential uh, um, breakout of the different uses that would be taking place and they decided to use from the three different uses that that they um, indicated in, in the response. The general office building which out of the three uses that were included in the response generated a higher than average, higher than the other two results 
uh, the other two potential uh, land use codes. Um, what it means is that they are actually assuming a higher, uh, a more conservative analysis for the, gener the potential traffic that will be gener generated by the site. Um, with that, uh, we feel that uh, the applicant has taken a conservative analysis of the projected volumes, and we are uh, in our opinion that no further action should be required because a revised analysis that we fine tune in is definitely not going to provide anything worse than what they are already included in the report or not in the report, um, and no further action required in our opinion. Uh, we had a comment that see if the trip generation was to be changed, then the internal trip generation would have to be uh, adjusted. Since there is no need to revise the trip generation, that internal uh, trip uh, capture is not does not require to be revised. So no further action is required in, in, that, in that topic as well. Um, um, some of the trips that were generated and distributed in the roadway network, depending on the use, were based on the existing travel patterns that are on the, on, the, on the roadways today, and that is typical of a traffic impact study. Um, we recommended that the um, report would be reviewed uh, for the specific purpose of the general office, more um, to reflect what the already data inf that exists for journey to work information for the town of Norton. Um, the applicant reviewed that, um, revised that, uh, potential trip distribution, and the change in the number of trips from one direction to the other one is 12, which uh, even if they were required to revise the whole report to reflect this change, the conclusions of the report would not change. Um, and the expected change of the level of service would be minimal, it's not significant. Our opinion is that they, they have provided the, the revised uh, travel patterns and that they are, there would not be any further action required for this for this topic. Um, <coughs> following up on the steps of the f uh, f final environmental impact report that was required by the MIPA process, um, there were a couple of, inter of few intersections that were added to reflect Saturday peak volumes. Um, we were requesting to include some of the intersections to the north of uh, Leonard Street. And due to the conversation that took place also during the last board meeting, there was a request from the applicant to disregard that, that request, and that was granted. So no further action is, is uh, required for that. But also, we, we concur with, with that request since the traffic um, that will be coming in and out of the side is most likely coming from the interstate rather from from the uh, local roadways um, that we within the town jurisdiction. Uh, <clears throat> we had some uh, concerns about since there is expected a lot of heavy uh, heavy uh, vehicles uh, added to the roadway network coming to the proposed side um, that that percentage of heavy vehicles which reduce the capacity of the intersections. Um, to be as well uh, documented of how the revised numbers were, not revised numbers, but the projected numbers were obtained. The uh, applicant provided that backup, and there is no further action required. We were concerned that the, the percentages were not uh, correctly adjusted, but the applicant provided the backup of how that was uh, generated, and we are uh, in, in agreement with those numbers as well. We raise a concern about the expected level of, of service and some of the queues um, that could be potentially observed along Main Street from Leonard um, for um, vehicles going in the northbound direction, and that could extend up to the signals and the ramps on 495, um, the nor 495 northbound ramps. Um, we requested that additional measures would be investigated. Uh, the applicant noted that there is some concerns about land that is being noted for conservation. 
um, there is no more space that could be taken for additional signal improvements. But as, is no, as, is, as it is noted on the final environmental report and has been um, requested by Mass DOT, the applicant is uh, proposing to have some detection um, closer to the ramp uh, in a way that when vehicles are extending up to that point, uh, the signal at Leonard Street would be triggered and it would help to clear the queues, reducing the potential um, backups from Leonard Street all the way to the interstate, which is something that Mazio T would be concerned. So some of the queues that are generated by the synchro analysis, by the capacity analysis, would still be showing that the queue would be extended up to, Mazio, uh, up to the uh, interstate ramps. And some of the mitigation um, that is technically feasible is to provide that those what we call in the industry Q, Q detectors. The applicant is already um, proposing to to implement those as part of the uh, the traffic signal installation, and as has been requested as well by Mass DOT, we feel that uh, with the restrictions that exist at the intersection of Leonard and Main Street, this is a good way to mitigate those potential backups. Um, uh, we don't feel that there, there is any further action required for, from the applicant on this regard. Can, and I, I don't want to get sidetracked, but I'll forget. And I, I've heard it mentioned, we're talking the other corner, um, having restrictions. Are those, is that, yes, you're a familiar face. Um, my name is Maureen Strozinski, um, 283 East Main, and the president of the Kingsbury Hill Condo Association. We own that. Right. So we have appeared before the selectmen um, about our desire to get the conservation restriction. It's not a conservation. That's not, it's, it's a development restriction. It's not, it's not it's under conservation. That, we un it's under conservation restriction. But I'm, I'm sorry, just so I'm clear, because you're a familiar face, because years ago I was on the Board of Assessors. Right. And, and I understood it to be a development restriction, but it's not under conservation commission unless things have changed. Well, it's a moving target as we proceeded this down this road. We were originally told it was a zoning restriction related to the development of the condo association right. on open space. Right. We have more open space excluding that land than is required under the restriction. So we were pursuing that avenue. Then we got told, after going to the selectmen who supported our concept about removing the restriction, then we were told the restriction <coughs> was, and I believe it's chapter 97, um, that relates to wetlands. There are no wetlands in the area that we're talking about on the corner. And at the same time, Condon is filling in six acres of wetland across the street. So we are in the process of trying to set up another meeting with the town official, the town manager, um, now that we have a town planner, and um, others to clarify this. We would like to ask the town, the selectmen have said they would support us, that we would go through the process of removing that conservation restriction. The process is the town has to support it, being the selectmen and the conservation commission. Then we have to go to town meeting and then we have to go to legislature. We've already got the legislative end covered. If we go there, they will support us with the support of the town. So we are trying to get these meetings set up to do that. So that's my question tonight. Since your traffic study, as we read it, says for both safety related to crosswalks and uh, perhaps a roundabout, if, the, if those are in the interest of the town around this development, that they would assist us in getting that restriction removed. It is not impossible. A lawyer and some environmental engineers have worked with us and have spelled out to us what the options could be. So. That's my question to you is, as I understand you have a public hearing on the 18th of December about this. We got a notice saying there was a public hearing on the December 18th about the special permit. It was sent out to all oh, the for, for, uh, for building seven. Well, it's for this development. Okay. Yes, yes, uh, cor uh, right, correct. And so you won't be, when, will you, when is your plan, when is the deadline that you have to close the hearing on the special permit. To be honest, the deadline is when, once we're satisfied that we've heard everything we need to hear in order to make a decision. Right, so there's so no. We would have the possibility. We are trying to set up meetings, and it might not be 
till the end of December with the key members of the town, with the new information we have, to clarify what exactly is the restriction, because it goes, first it was a space restriction. We own a 40-foot right-of-way down further on um, Lennon Street that we're happy to give to the town. So they could, and that's an open space where gear hang out. It's much more conservation related than that corner of lot. So that our concern is that you not proceed ahead till we can get the answers. Because it appears as if removal of that restriction will benefit the town in terms of safety and in terms of traffic. And yes, we'd like to sell another portion of it, or perhaps we sell to the town that portion. But those are the discussions that are still ongoing. So to propose this now and give them permit, you're leaving a substantial amount of information hanging out there that could benefit the town in terms of safety and traffic. And in terms of traffic, I would ask you to go down to the next exit, um, exit nine, which is the Bay Street exit, that is the entrance actually to the other industrial park in front, around four o'clock or five o'clock or nine o'clock in the morning, and see how far that traffic backs up on the ramp off of Bay Street because of where, the way those lights are set up. So our concern is, however this is set up without some really accommodation and mitigation for the traffic, you're greatly impacting residents and our development and the Red Mill development on that roadway. So we would respectfully ask that we wait till we hear from the conservation, the town. It's, it's the Board of Selectmen plus the conservation. When we went to the Board of Selectmen, they said, we support your idea and concept, we will support you. The Conservation Commissioner, not the Conservation Board, of, has told us two different stories on what the restriction is. We have researched it, we believe we have the information on what the restriction is, and we, have, we know the exact outline of what has to be done to remove the restriction. It is not an impossible thing to do at this time. Thank you. Uh, I just was confused as to the conservation restriction apparently, so are some others, but understood. Uh, in any case, uh, with the understanding that there is not a lot of space to expand the intersection. We, we feel that that option of providing the queue detection would help to mitigate any potential backups to the interstate. Um, regarding the site access, we, um, I'm sorry, no, we requested to, pro to have also backup for the warrant analysis of the intersection of uh, Leonard Street and Main Street, and the backup was provided. We review it and it meets the, 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 the warrant, so the signal is definitely warranted at that location. Um, we requested to have the side distance out of Leonard Street to be confirmed that it meets the Ashto guidelines. Uh, and mostly is if a person or a driver is stopped on Leonard Street and is trying to make a right or a left turn out of the side, if they can uh, see someone who is um, going on Main Street. Uh, with the signal, the left turns would not be allowed at any time unless they have the green light. Our concern is with the green light, um, when the red light, and if the car wants to go right, to go north. Um, there was no clarification about if the side distance is appropriate or not for that, uh, which requires a right turn on red restriction sign or, or not. Um, but we don't feel that that is an impediment on the, uh, that that is a minor detail on the signal design that could, could be addressed as the design of the signal is finalized. As of now, it's in a, in a concept design. Um, as a concept, we, we concur with the signal as it is. The right turn on red would not have a significant impact on the level of service of the intersection. And even if, if it does, it would be mostly on Leonard Street, not on uh, Main Street. So that we recommend that this uh, item is addressed during the further stages of the design of the intersection of the signal um, as it is. Um, was also one uh, uh, clarification that in the report they were mentioned, they, it was mentioned that the site would have two driveways on Leonard Street. And looking at the overall plan, this is actually four driveways. 
the clarification was noted from the uh, applicant, and it's just a minor thing. It's uh, something that happens in, in these review processes when you uh, develop a draft environmental impact report. You have certain assumptions, certain statements, um, and then as you are moving forward addressing all the different concerns from the public through the MIVA process, some of those um, um, assumptions and uh, um, little details are fine-tuned and it might, be, it might have been a mistake that it was carried over from one report to the other one, but it's just a clarification that would be needed if there was a revision of the final environmental impact report, which we don't feel that is necessary. Um, we requested um, for, from the applicant to provide a plan that showed how the uh, emergency vehicles as well as truck trailers were moving around the site to confirm that the the width of the driveways and all the roads is uh, adequate for the vehicles. And uh, the applicant provided us with so those uh, term move accounts, uh, not term move accounts, for those um, um, plans showing the vehicle, the, the wheel path for the different vehicles. And it was provided only for the tractor trailers in the first two sites, which they, those vehicles are significantly bigger than uh, fire truck. Uh, we don't feel that there is needed any need to provide how um, a fire truck would be accessing the site, but there was uh, something that was missed on the other two um, driveways on Leonard Street to the properties that would be on the back. That information was not provided. Um, it, it would be a very simple plan for the applicant to develop. Uh, that's just something that would be lingering, but in general, it doesn't. Um, it would be just to confirm that the vehicles can access the site without having any trouble. Um, that's just something that we, we still feel that the applicant should provide, and it's, it's not a significant level of effort in, in, our, uh, in our view. Sir, would you, when you say southern driveways and northern driveways on the map here, what are you, which ones are you referring to? We are referring to these two driveways. The, okay. the vehicle path was provided for accessing these properties. But it was not provided for the back. For, the, for, for, for phase the, okay, two. For those. Yeah, for okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Yep. Right mark for phase two? Correct. Those yeah, will okay. be yeah. provided uh, with the building seven filing and the next filing. Okay. Okay. Um, in a similar situation, we. Uh, we wanted to have some uh, information on how the pedestrian uh, intervals were calculated uh, for the traffic signal analysis. Uh, the response from the from the applicant was that that would be fine-tuned and generated as um, fine-tuned and fi uh, further determined through the design of the traffic signal, which is typical of the design process uh, when you're working on a concept. You are estimating certain uh, distances. Or, um, and as you are refining your design, you determine where the different um, traffic signal equipment will be located. And as part of that design, uh, those um, um, calculation sheets should be provided. So similarly to the no turn on red restriction, if it is needed or not, uh, we recommend that the town uh, follows through when uh, through the signal design that this is addressed. But we don't feel that that's a, a concern at this point. Um, so those, those are this, uh, I would call it a summary, but like description of all the different comments that we had and the response, responses that we received from the applicant. I'll be happy to answer any questions that you, you may have. Members of the board have <coughs> questions or? Yeah, uh, I don't know, have you gotten a copy of the outline that I provided? Did you, did you look through the, the comments that I sent over, that was sent over? Yes, yes, yeah, the, uh, Paul was uh, kind enough to send us the, the questions that you had. Um, Some of these may go to the applicant themselves, and I just really wanted to get, I know you guys are going forward with a final, some final plans, and I just want to put these on the table so you can get a sense of some of the comments we have and maybe some of these things you can address and, and some he can address, if that's okay, Mr. Chairman, can I go through these? Um, the first thing that I noticed was at the light at, New, at the Leonard Street, um, there's something, it looks like at the intersection across the street but it doesn't match up with the Dunkin' Donut parcel. You, you show something on the other side, I'm not sure what that's supposed to be and what the intent is. Is that gonna match up <coughs> with Dunkin' Donuts or not? That's the town-owned parcel, right, Mark? The town, yes, it's, it's the town-owned town land yeah. access. 
I just took a snapshot. We received the comments, you know, uh, in the middle of today. Uh, so I think this is what you're talking about. I mean, what we're proposing is a potential apron to this, uh, to, there's like a right of way here. This is the Dunkin' Donut driveway. Mm -hmm. um, so there's potential for, in the, the drive through is way back here. There's potential for access, both Dunkin' Donuts to, to use this in the future, if they agree to, to aligning to the intersection, as well as there also appears to be potential for the DPW building as well to align access. But right now, we don't have any particular agreements in place for that to happen. Um, we are providing the signal will be set up with lights and you know for that situation but um you know we have nothing in place with formal agreements to get any of that traffic through this uh, so right now the exit from dunkin donuts is how far away from that light um roughly it's a and it's a right turn only um but to the stop sign you know it's only about a car length it's about a car length access from exiting that to the stop stop line that would be proposed, maybe two car lengths. Now, the, the no, go ahead, go ahead. I, I want to let the board ask their yeah, questions, then I, I'll. I just had a question before we move out of this. Okay. The, the mass DOT relative to that particular site talked about, I believe, seven accidents in five years. Um, I had gotten some information from the, from the Norton police, um, and it, 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 and I don't know what uh, I'm, I don't know what they, how they classify under the mass DOT their criteria versus what's reported by the police. But the police department showed, I think I put it in here, um, between the two, there's like 20, 29 out of the Dunkin' Donut parcel and another, can I have it here? Yeah, there was uh, in nine in five years at, at the, that intersection, including 237, 238, 240, and 250, and 29 in five years of the Dunkin' Donut parcel for a total of 38 accidents, it looks like to me. I, again, I didn't qualify each of them. Um, I'm assuming that, that that's a component several times what the mass DOT is providing, and I'm concerned. I, I know that area has, has had difficulty, and now unless that's tied in in some way to this site, you've got a car length, with a queue that's going back from what I can tell from their, from their letter from, from this, um, past not only the Dunkin' Donuts exit, but the entrance to Dunkin' Donuts uh, on that queue, and even beyond that. And I'm trying to find out the way to, to make that. Uh, I, it sounds to me that's kind of a dangerous intersection at this point. And I don't know that this will make it any better, because you now have people waiting out of a queue going back <coughs> Pass both those intersections to try to get into it. I, I, um, if I may, uh, we saw the numbers, but we did not see the specific description of the crashes. In a Dunkin' Donuts, some of the crashes could be actually related to the parking lot and the way that the reporting crashing system works. You identify them as the location. So without having the narrative, we, it was not it was not possible for us to determine if they were happen if those crashes took place on Main Street of the, if they took place in the parking lot, which would be um, another, uh, there is nothing that, that applies to the public right of way. Um, and in regard of how a signal would affect the, the Dunkin' Donuts uh, driveways, definitely having a signal that provides um, platooning um, and certain gaps on the flow of traffic would be beneficial. Um, certainly having both the Dunkin' Donuts and Mazio T coming out to the signal and having that exit, uh, access to that um, proposed leg, that would be the most uh, safety benefit for, for these two driveways. And honestly, if, if the, there is an uncomfortable location where you are driving and you're going to get your coffee there and you have a hard time trying to get in or out, you're going to choose another Dunkin' Donuts. Well, there's, understand, there's more yep. than Dunkin' Donuts there. The rest of that parking lot includes a karate school, and I've been there, and you can't even get in and out at 5 o'clock for that karate school. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's not just Dunkin' Donuts. It's a whole, it's a whole little shopping plaza mm -hmm. uh, that now somewhat would empty out onto that 123 as well. Mm -hmm. uh, Which is owned by Denny. 
Rich. Uh, Orrin, would you allow? Um, sure. On that on that one topic. Sure. Uh, so the. Um, most of the, the majority of the traffic will come out on Leonard Street and take a left and get onto the highway. So they will not be driving past um, the entrance uh, to that development. And I think, as he mentioned, a traffic light will benefit the area. <coughs> e even w e with or without <coughs> development, it'll benefit the area, it'll slow people down. Um, but most of your traffic will turn left. This is back up down but the light is being designed so it's timed with all the other lights going up the ramps and everything else. So all the queuing has been done in the analysis all the way out to a 2024 full build and it shows all the queuing lengths and distances. So as that queuing is there and the lights are timed, that's supposed to flow the cars through so we don't have an extensive backup. And when you did your numbers, did you also count the number of cars that come out of that Dunkin' Donuts parking lot? Yeah, the, 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 backup, the backup plan you gave that shows mitigation for the weekday um, takes, takes that, that queue back way beyond both any of the entrance and exits of, uh, of the Dunkin' Donut parcel and the other ones as well. That goes back all the way to here. That's, I believe that's without the mitigation. No, not with this. This says with, this is with, down in the this is with mitigation. Now, Mark, just for clarification, you guys are only proposing the crosswalk in the apron, no traffic changes on town property. On, 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 you know, like we were talking about, although the light would be able to be four heads, at this point it's only three, that's the town's. Yes, Correct. any improvements. Property, and that is not a part of this project. But I, I think the, the, the issue that's being raised is traffic headed towards Easton, and this is north Easton. Traffic headed towards Easton, some of which is going to either want to turn into Dunkin' Donuts or the 495 Marketplace. Um, if the light headed towards the center um, is red, then people are going to be queuing up, blocking those entrances. Where are those, I'll call them eastbound uh, travelers, going to queue up waiting for the light to change and the westbound <coughs> traffic to free up so they can turn in. There's no, there's no center turning lane or, uh, so that those folks can get out so of this. This is initially what was proposed up in there. So wanted, could you clarify what your, okay. this left turn in, is that what uh, you're referring to? No, I'm, no. I'm talking about traffic headed, uh, let's, let's talk it right to left. 
Right to left, this way? This way. Now they get through the Leonard Street intersection, but they want to turn into Dunkin' Donuts or a little further up the marketplace. Yep. But the light going for traffic going left to right is red and now blocking the entrances to either Dunkin' Donuts or the marketplace. Where does that traffic headed towards Easton that wants to turn into either of those two facilities, where do they queue up? I mean, we can provide a, a, a sign signage package or some sort of do not block intersection. Yeah, but I, <clears throat> that, I, um, as was mentioned, the, all you have to do is spend two minutes at nine o'clock in the morning at the post office and that doesn't work. And, and what happens is traffic gets backed up into the, into the common uh, area. Um, you, you, you understand my, my point. Right. Uh, I, so I'm as of sure right now, without, without this implemented that's here, then the traffic is going to come here and it's going to have to take a left past the center where, the, where, it, where everyone's taking a left now. Right, the car. Right, but there's no light. That, but my point is there's no traffic light that stops the traffic headed towards the center, so you can queue up and wait your turn. But if the traffic is blocked because they're stopped for a, a in, red light. In theory, somebody going straight from the highway, the alternate direction would also have the green light to go straight unless it was the left arrow. Right. So it wouldn't be the full cycle. Right. I mean, it, it, it depends on They'll how the lights are at time. the same time. The through lanes will be moving at the same time. Right. Right. If so. that's the way the, the lights are. So I'm, I'm going to assume, Francisco, can you speak to that? No, yeah, Smaller. absolutely. Uh, I mean, Yes, you may have some cues that are developing from Leonard towards away from the highway, but when the green light is provided to two directions, they, on the true uh, traffic, the two of them are going to be... So there's not going to be a dedicated left-hand turn light only? There would be, there but, would then be there right. other, but then coming from the highway would be red because they couldn't right. go through the arrow. Yeah, yeah. so Correct. it would be That'd one be phase, red. one phase of the light. Yeah, the traffic on Main Street would be going at the same time. So even if there may be a queue, there may be someone who is yeah. kind enough to give them the right of way, make a left turn, and being able to. And in theory, the left arrow would go consecutively with the straight ahead lane. Right. Yeah, Correct. Going at, so it would so. clear out before people, so that lane would clear out, and then people going through and going to Duncan would, get a, in theory, have a clear lane. And, and the queues that are noted on the reports are not necessarily what you're going to see every single time. It's the longest queue that you would expect to see in the 90% time of the time, 95% um, of the time, which means that sometimes you may see only one or two cars, and it could be as long as that. But it doesn't mean that you're going to see that uh, queue every single cycle mm -hmm. of the signal. Yeah. The page that Orrin has here does show it going past the parking lot at the 50th percentile. Mm -hmm. And that's for the 2024 build out. Correct. So that's mm -hmm. complete build out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, once Both the site is completed. Both completed. Mm -hmm. The whole nine yards. Correct. Yes. So that's, I'd say, the worst possible scenario in the 90th percentile. Correct. Um, the, the MEPA process uh, seemed to strongly recommend a roundabout at that intersection. I, I don't know. What, what impact would that have if that were available in terms of um, making that situation less onerous? Uh, there would need to be a, a capacity analysis of a roundabout. Normally, they tend to help to reduce the traffic uh, speed. They are safer, and they process more uh, vehicles than a regular traffic signal. Um, one of the drawbacks from a roundabout is that it requires a lot more land. Mm. And my understanding is that that was discarded during the MIPA process because of the uh, understood landlocked situation. But a roundabout uh, single lane, is there is nothing safer than a single lane roundabout uh, that we implemented here. With that said, we did not do a roundabout capacity analysis to confirm that a single lane would work here there would need to be something uh, further studied to confirm if a single lane or, or two lanes on one of the approaches would be required. But in general, a roundabout would, would be able to process the traffic fast, um, n not faster, more efficiently. And um, if you are a traffic signal, 
and you want to go through, you see the yellow is supposed to be in, uh, slow down, there's going to be the light change, but we drivers, we don't want to wait for another signal. It means really step on the gas, go through. Um, with a roundabout, their geometry is such that you would not be able to go through the intersection at higher speeds than 20, 25 miles an hour, depending on the design. So if there were no land restrictions on how much space could be occupied from the traffic and safety perspective, that would be a recommended um, solution to be further explored. Whether it would be a single lane or two lanes on each approach, that's something that the traffic analysis would have to determine. Can, can I also say, and roundabouts are, like I said, really good for, for movement of vehicles, but one of the trade-offs is they tend not to be very good for pedestrians. So here, you know, Condine's proposing a crosswalk, cross 123, roundabout, you'd have to be very careful because you have that continuous flow and they tend to be very uh, contradictory to walking. In fact, that's the reason why as we're working on the, um, the, the town center concept and the alignment of 123 and 140 that, uh, Tim, correct me, but one of the reasons the roundabout was taken off was because we wanted to promote people crossing there and we were just concerned that that was, a roundabout would contradict that <clears throat> with, with that said, Paul, well, um, roundabouts would, they do have the continuous flow, and if you compare the existing location, trying to cross the existing location versus a roundabout, if you're a pedestrian, you have to mind two different directions of travel. Right. With a roundabout, you only, you are only concerned about one direction of travel sure. um, at a time, and then you have a median. Where but you, you have a controlled refuge. light. Not necessarily a control light, but you would have a, a median where you can find refuge. No, and if the geometry... Right. With a stoplight, you have a control light. With a roundabout, you with, do not have a control right. light that pedestrians can utilize. Yeah. Yes, I agree. Yeah. agree. Yeah. <clears throat> um, yeah, let me... Let me Looking at the same thing, um, at one point there was a, a proposal, um, I think it was recommended by, again, uh, MEPA, for a right-hand turn uh, lane uh, out of Leonard Street onto 123. And I think right now it shows that that's being, there's existing pavement that's being loamed and seeded. Is that part of the conservation restriction or is that, is there yeah. existing pavement there? Um, I mean, there, on the approach, there's some uh, room to make it work, but to make the turning radiuses work as required, there's just not enough room. Um, as you start coming around the corner, uh, you so can see that this this turning radius here making this turning radius work. It's just there's there's no room um, to to have the appropriate radius uh, when you just to get around there with an additional lane, especially with the truck. But that's going back to the the conservation land as well. Again, I mean, if that was lifted, Perfect. there's flexibility, but it's uh, we've been told it's nearly impossible. So um, they obviously have researched it and have attorneys. What we've been told. Yeah, that's by um, staff. I'm variety of people. So I'm assuming that you get it lifted us. all for it, but yes. <laughs> we, we, we can't, that, we that can't right wait until that happens. Only would be uh, beneficial. It would help to increase the capacity of the intersection, indeed. Okay, um, I, I know we have raised this before on the the, the, the non-lighted uh, 123 from the from the retail section. Um, I, again, uh, is it clear that that's not going to be? There's no trucks going to be allowed into that at all, or correct? Yeah, there's going to be as much directional signage as possible that that's not a truck entrance. 
um, the main truck entrances will be on Leonard Street. Uh, in fact, the um, I didn't provide turning radiuses in the negative effect. I provided to, to fire department. We did provide the apparatus turning radius to get in that make that right turn in. What I didn't provide was a like almost a negative picture of that a, a tractor trailer cannot make that turn satisfactory um, off of 123 into that first exit. So okay. The, so it's been designed for fire and emergency, but not for tractor trailer. And we we did even entertain Paul's idea of uh, even lessening those radii even more, like the, all the way down to five feet. So it's a, almost a 90 degree sharp turn in there, um, but it's a requirement in the fire code to be a certain radius. So we. I think the original proposal, I think we had 30 foot radiuses. We did drop it down to a 25 foot radius um, that the fire department wanted. Um, and I did provide them with some concepts of even further um, reducing that, but the fire department uh, held firm on the 25 foot requirement. So. Um, okay. Um, but then, then looking again at the, the right hand turn coming out of that intersection, again, looking at the the mitigated queue going backwards, um, uh, I don't know, just is, there, is that absolutely necessary as opposed to, I mean, if you look at the, the, the queue going back, it, it wipes out any ability to make any turns there at all, let alone having to take a turn going out beyond the, the right-hand turn only lane. We um, continue to provide that right turn out as uh, an option for the users of the retail. Um, to, you know, just as a people comfortable making that right turn out and heading that, that way on, on 123, we're trying to continue to provide that option. Um, with a PMQ is it, is going back to four, um, it's it, not required, it, but we With a PMQ it. going back to 495? I think it is passed on. So. So that, I mean, that could be used in a non-peak period. If it is a backed up area, then it just gives more option instead of funneling everybody out of one location all the time. Correct. It also gives, I think, a quicker uh, in and out for emergency vehicles if needed. Because um, you, de you design it in and out for. Typically, they're mostly concerned with getting in. Right. But. From a capacity of the intersection compared on 495, I think one of the uh, butters had mentioned kind of uh, Miles Standish and Taunton. Jeff, you may be able to give some clarity on this, but the size the size of Miles Standish in relation to this project is significantly bigger. Yeah, Miles Standish has uh, roughly six million square feet and probably about 6,500 employees in the park. So it's traversing. About Six times larger? Correct. And traversing through the park is also from um, from Norton as a back way where there's yeah. a lot of discussion back and forth. So? So they've installed as many lights as they can and timed them as much as they can and, and right turns right off, and they're still analyzing sig signal intersections today. What, what property was that? The Miles Standish Industrial Exit Park on Bay Street. Bay yeah, Street. on Bay yeah. Street at yeah. 9. The, yeah, where they just redid the, the layout. You'd mentioned that in terms of backup yeah. on 25, but it's six times bigger than this, so. Right, but 123 is a, a much smaller road edge and the entrance to there, and 123 sends significant increase in traffic, sends significant increase in traffic, sends significant increase in traffic, sends behind one, tw building one and two, pushing the parking behind those buildings. Uh, the bylaw provides to the extent feasible, parking areas should be limited, located to the side or the rear of the structures. Is there any particular reason why we, why you wouldn't be able to do that in this particular um, scenario? I think that the bylaw is related to, um, I'll find the bylaw for you on that, but our main reason for that. 15.62. Excuse me? 15.62. Well, our main reason behind that is as you get into the site and into the property. So 
taking these buildings and moving forward and creating this large mass of paving and parking also backs up to a forty foot probably forty five foot clear building warehouse built it doesn't match with the retail that's facing it so all this area would be facing each other where we have retail and then we have a forty six foot tall building so it's just kind of in, in our main goal here is this retail becomes accessory use to most of the industrial park and most of this tenants that are in here are going to want to grab the traffic that is coming down Route 123. So, and again, it's just if you look at the driver. Westwood site, they they do that Which often. One? If you look at the Westwood property, the the um, Fidelity, University Ave. Huh? University Ave. If you drive into the major center, from Target to um, all the major food stores and, and Wegmans and all that, I'm, I'm they're all set way back, and then they face this way towards the street. Except and then they do have smaller ancillary. I live in Westwood, so okay. I shop there, so I know I know the the park very well. Okay, it's there. there. It's University Station in Westwood at the time of the former GM building in Westwood, and now it's got Wegmans and Target and all sorts of places. Right. So what they have is a massive parking field facing each other between that. And that's not what we're desired for here. Here we're trying to separate the warehouse use and the retail use. And again, we just have a single row of parking. Um, and even half of that, you know, once you're to the intersection side, you know, you're starting to, it's up against the remaining um, interchange, you know, once. Once you're between Leonard and our driveway on 123, yes, it is, it is directly against um, the street. But again, it's one driveway with just two parking spaces. And then beyond that, you see it angles off, and it's not even. Um, yeah, but, you know, it's but, similar to other retail developments. On the, you know, we don't have a. It's not a grocery store with 400 parking lots out in front, a sea of parking, uh, 500 feet deep. So we're we're, we're continuing on the permitting path uh, with this parking in front, one row of parking, and the retail buildings. Is parking to the rear feasible? <clears throat> that's what the, that's the standard that was what we're asking. And the reason, one of the things I'm, I'm looking at myself, to tell you the truth, is give, given the, the sensitivity of that, that one area, <clears throat> if you have someone coming in there holding up, looking for parking spaces, and delaying that turn, because they don't know whether they're gonna go left or go right, you're going to back up into 123, and that's something I, I'd like to see cars getting off of 123 and away from it as fast as possible, and not backing up while they're waiting to see whether they're going to go left or right, or whether another car is coming out. And I think that, for me, I'm looking more of it from the dangerous point of view. And certainly, uh, retailers can have storefronts in the front as well as in the back. Uh, they do it all the time. And they especially, do, and, and we were making sure that the loading is at the rear of the stores where the other warehouse <coughs> building is as well. So if we're trying to get uh, inventory into the stores, there's, it, it's, it, we can't get loading out in the front if we push the buildings out. So the loading is going to have to be right in the parking lot going right in the front door. And the visibility-wise, as, as coming down, this, this is the visibility. This section here, sorry it's a smaller plan, but when you're coming down looking, that's the first thing you're going to see. We're, everyone's worried about how they're going to see the warehouses. The warehouses are all set in the back down on Leonard Street. So the visibility point is to make these architecturally <clears throat> pleasing to the eye, and that's why we've come up with some great designs and great renderings that's going to be there so people can see what's there instead of looking at the back of the retail. I'm not suggesting that that be the back of the retail. And retailers will saying, sign it. Retailers will saying sign it this. You're saying push this all the way as close as I can to Route 123. I can't get parking there, so what's there? People are going to park around the back and walk around the store to get in the front door? That doesn't happen. No, you, you, I, you won't do that. I won't do that. Retailers have two entrances. Yeah, but they're not going to go in the back door if they don't have to. They want to go in the front door. You're gonna have, if you're going to have pedestrians walking, and you're going to attract pedestrians that can go in the front. If not, so it, it, I'm not going to argue with it. Uh, the next. Um, and wait a minute, just to answer your question on 15.6.2, the way you're talking about buildings close to the road. That's in a village commercial district. Village commercial. We're, we're industrial. No, it's not. Design in the village commercial district. 
Buildings shall be close, close to the road and sidewalk to encourage pedestrian traffic. No, if you go on to, there's, there's the objectives. You look at the objectives. I'll get it for you in the back. The looking for objectives. That's villages, commercial, or something different. Uh, entrance to retail. Um, I have a question is, why aren't we having, why aren't you having a separate entrance into, into the warehouse space? Why are you trying to combine an entrance into to the, the, to the driveways, the yeah. two driveways? Yeah. Because it, two things, most importantly, as the tenants occupy the buildings, tenants always need two means of access to the facilities. So either way, that has to happen, and it's also for life safety. That's why we loop the buildings and bring access all the way around. The second reason, if there's ever a labor strike or a labor issue, they can only pick at one entrance. We need a second entrance to get the company still operating in and out of the building. And then lastly, as trucks come into this section, as they turn to the right, we want them backing in on the proper side. What we don't want is a truck coming down Leonard, coming into this driveway and backing in here. Now, if you don't know what backing in on the right side and wrong side is, is when the driver's looking out the window and the truck's piggybacking the other way, he can't see. So he comes this way and backs in and he can see his trailer backing up into the door. That's why we have two entrances and that's why this driveway is important to get the vehicles in the facility. You have um, <clears throat> parking lanes, um, as I read them, 75 feet long. How long are the trucks that you anticipate having at these warehouses? Trucks are 48-foot uh, trailers, and they're about 16-foot in the caps. Okay. Um, um, I, I, I can tell you from experience myself, but I also know my wife, there's no way she's going to try and wrestle that turn as a, as a truck is coming in there and going out. Um, I've been at, one, at one, 140, and I've had to back up as, as one of those trucks is taking a right-hand turn, coming off of 140 onto 123. And if, if that's anything like that, especially you're using only 30 feet. But I was asking whether or not I don't mind having two entrances, but why have a, why have a joint entrance with the retail and might not have a, separate, a second separate entrance going into building, it's a building four? You can have that, that the entrance you have, the other entrance that, that joins the two as well, uh, and leaving the retail section separate. Or if you were going to do that, why isn't that at least the 50 feet that's required for an industrial use? Especially when you're combining it with retail. <clears throat> I mean, it's fine. I understand that in, in the commerce play, way, uh, maybe only 30 feet. So, Oren, we've developed, I don't know, 10 million square feet of warehouse buildings, industrial buildings, and everything else that's going to be there. We haven't constructed one driveway that is 50 feet in length all the way down the seam. So the 50 feet length that every building that we've done in Norton and every building we've done in Taunton is exceeding at the mouth. That's what we're designed for. 50 feet coming in is four lanes, 11, 11, 11, 11, and six feet, three feet on either side for a shoulder. That's how wide it is. Do you know how wide a 50 foot road is? Yes, I do. Uh, have you have done you, any of those four buildings? lane highway? Have you done any of those buildings combining with the retail use as well? Yeah, we've done a little mix of that. 30 feet long? And 50 feet, this whole thing would become a massive paving all the way across. But that's what's required under the bylaws, for one. But uh, if you want to do 30 then, feet, then, I'm, I'm just then. saying, I'm, I'm just asking why, why you're combining a retail use with an industrial use and leaving it at 30 feet. Our bylaws call for 50. Okay, you can make an argument that for an industrial use, all you need is 30. I, I could go along with that. I don't have a problem with that. But when you're combining that with a retail use, I, I think that's going to be that's just looking for a problem, and I'm just I just question yes. why you <clears throat> if you didn't want most of the trucks. So if they're sitting in these doors that are here, correct? These sitting in the doors that are in this location, those trucks are always going to enter exit to the left, and they're going to want to go out this entrance. Because because they're sitting in the doors, they're going to drive and they're going to take the left, the easier way out. So it's difficult for them to go out this section. This is primarily really used for a lot of these small retail delivery trucks. And most of those, I hope, are in the off hours that right. the retail you, is not open. Are you going to restrict truck traffic um, from the loading area to go out? That I don't mind time? that. We don't mind that. I mean, I, I, don't I, mind I agree with all. you that the natural, because if other truck traffic is coming in that direction, they don't want to conflict with that. No. So it's obviously uh, easier for all concerned if they exit out that second driveway. So that I have no issue with that whatsoever. Solves that.
<clears throat> you provided some chip generation schedules, and maybe I just, I'm just not reading it right. When, when I calculated the total square footages that you provided, one was 800, for the Saturday was 868,900 versus the 887 that's being proposed. And for the weekly uh, PMs, for the weekly schedule, your, your calculations only add up to 807,000 square feet. Uh, is that on design? Uh, yeah, or? I took a look at that. It looks like, and you know, we can res resubmit, it looks like the 807 um, was basically a typo. So we can resubmit that to the traffic. Um, it should be, <coughs> I have one here, I can give it to them. Um, the warehouse on the report, I think it only said 513,800. It should be 593,800. Does so that, that change your numbers? Are your numbers um, correct? Or is it, 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 it does adjust the numbers. I mean, we can have McMahon take a look at those. Um, okay. That's, it was a basically on that, that different number. It, it, at this point, can I just ask a question in terms of traffic and uh, trip generation? Uh, and I apologize if it's in there someplace, but somewhere I thought the anticipated trips per day were somewhere between 1,000 and 1,500. Is that, am I remembering that correct? Or? No, it's like 3,000, I thought. And, and I, I, I know that it's very speculative right. because you don't have tenants, you don't know what the uses are, right. but I'm, I'm just trying to get a, trips per day have never made any, have never been relevant to it's me, but I'm just trying to understand what your volume is, and then I'm going to ask a follow-up question. This is 3794. Yeah, I think one. it's more like 30. Okay, 3800. 3, um, a, a, a supermarket generates what, roughly, trips per day? You have a good idea of that? No, I don't top my head. It all depends on the square um, footage. Square, um, well, a supermarket sometimes. Double the triple that traffic flow. Right, but I mean, the only, frankly, the only experience I have is from another life that um, had a Lowe's generating 7,000 trips per day mm -hmm. on a Saturday. Um, a shopping center with a Target, a super stop and shop, and a um, Home Goods, 23,000 trips a day. So, this would generate less than a Lowe's. On I, full build. Your no. entire plaza. Entire, no, industrial yes. too, everything. Yes. You, you, right, your, your whole, your whole. The whole build. Oh. Right. Um, a, a Cumberland Farms with gas generates 1,000 trips a day. So we're talking three Cumberland Farms. Mm -hmm. And to the extent, I, again, I know it's speculative, but you located here, I assume, for a purpose, i.e. 495. Correct. What assumptions are you making as to traffic, um, what percentage of traffic is going to come off 495, go in, come out, of 490, come out and go on 495 so that intersections further uh, east and west are going to be unaffected? What, is there a percentage that? Yeah, I believe it was 85 to 90 percent. Okay. So that... 10%, 400 trips per day is going to disperse throughout secondary roads. Okay. Again, I just want to understand, because trips per day don't mean anything to me until I tie them in with businesses that I'm familiar with. And, and just to clarify, even though you may have 400 trips per day that are going through the local roadway network, your biggest concern is when those trips are, taking, are consistent with the peak hour. Right. Your, your parking schedule uh, reflects, uh, among other things, and I think this is, uh, some of these are brought up in, in the, um, the new filing we got from Horsley Witten, some of the things we're talking about. But one of the questions I had is, is uh, parking for the retail, there's about 30 spaces short, and you're suggesting that you want to share those with the warehouse use? Um, we've actually um, 
made some adjustments through the site. Um, we only had a single row of parking here and we've matched it up with the rest of the property. We've actually, when we resubmit um, for the final review or for the second review, um, we're actually adding 36 spaces to the retail area. <coughs> so um, we feel on the resubmittal, um, we, will re we will meet the requirement. We won't even be requesting, um, originally we requested a 19% reduction for um, sharing parking throughout the retail and a reduction. So now we feel we're going to be meeting the zoning requirements for the retail area, um, okay. as well as um, there was a further comment about handicapped spaces. We'll make sure we have the... Um, okay, good. Thank you. As we raise those numbers, the handicapped accessible spaces change. Okay. Yeah, the proportion is evened out, Mark. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> on some of the off-site, the, there was a... Um, the, you showed some mitigating conditions, uh, and I don't... I, I just think for myself it was help, would be helpful. The way you, you showed... The, you showed um, building with proposed mitigation as opposed to... Um, building without mitigation. Um, for me, th what I'm concerned about is the no build versus, I'm assuming you're going to make that mitigation. You're going to need to make the mitigation. So I, I was just interested in seeing a comparison of a, a no build versus a, a, a build with mitigation. Because um, in some cases, those, that's pretty significant in terms of its disparity. Do you follow what I'm asking, what I'm suggesting? We can. Look into that. I, I, I just, just uh, queue distance, or what are you what are you referring to? Um, well, if you look at, at 51 and 52, that's a schedule you guys pro you provided. This is uh, table 14, build with mitigation capacity. You just you did the analysis against the build um, versus build with mitigation, which tells us what you're improving it by. But I'm assuming we're looking at the the mitigated versus the no build. To, to really get a sense of what's happening at those intersections. And I just put in some numbers. I was trying to adjust them. Um, and in one particular, and in some particular case, uh, the, the cues were really off. I was looking at, um, what was it, in, um, in the 123 in East Leonard, at Leonard Street for the PM. Uh, you show 726 when it's actually, I think, 798. And one of the call-outs where I think you, um, Mipa was concerned that the queue was going beyond a 495 ramp, um, and you used 726, noting the distance was 730 feet. And it, it, from what I could tell, it's actually 798 feet. And again, I don't know with what you were you saying they were going to do would, would adjust that or not, but from the numbers I was seeing, it looked like your your queue goes beyond the 495 ramp and that was not what was in the MEPA report. Yeah, you are correct. We, we check and there, is, there was a typo between what is shown in the report versus what is on the tables. Um, and that concern should be addressed with the queue detection that is that we discussed earlier about making sure that once the cars reach out to certain distance close to the ramps, the light at Leonard Street will be triggered to be green and clear the vehicles. So even though the synchro analysis shows that that is what you could potentially see, um, the uh, queue detection will guarantee that there would not be a backup beyond that once the cars are reaching certain well, how, distance. Once that affects, how does that affect the backup going back on Leonard Street then? I'm assuming if it's letting cars go as that backup hits 495, you're going to generate even a further backup on Leonard Street? Leonard Street? It, sh it would generate a sl slightly longer delay to Leonard Street, but that typically gets dissipated within a couple of cycles. Okay. Now, now the, the <clears> numbers <throat> we're talking about, are these basically cars, or are they talking about 40, 50 foot trucks as well? And I, I don't know how that, that computes. Yeah, uh, the way that the capacity analysis works is that you not only account for the number of cars, but also a percentage of heavy vehicles, and that, uh, that takes into account when the uh, queues are calculated by the capacity analysis. So the numbers that, that are reported are taking into account the number, the percentage of heavy trucks that would be present on the traffic flow. I believe you mentioned in your review that content had used numbers for heavy vehicles that were on the higher end of the spectrum. Correct. They, they did a conservative analysis. Okay. Um, then I, I, I was just looking at the, um, the level of service at a couple of uh, areas. Um, 
I, I know myself, I, I've tried to go down uh, 123 toward uh, Taunton Street uh, during the rush hour, and there's this considerable backup. And I'm looking at their numbers, and from what I could tell, the AM um, level of service is, is F uh, for both the no build and the build. I'm assuming it's going to be made worse. And it's a, in PM, it's E for the no build, and it goes up to an F for the build. Um, I, I'm just concerned about that. I don't know what they could do about it. I don't know if there's anything, you know, but uh, Where is I that think, referring to, Orange? What? Where is that referring to? That's referring to Taunton Ave and 123. Okay. There's the tables in the environmental impact report, correct? Yeah, page 45. Um, and, and again, even with what they're doing, AM and PM on the southbound ramp is B with no build, and it goes to C. Um, and Newland Street goes from, uh, it goes, uh, it goes, it, it's F now, and it's going to stay F, AM and PM. It's getting worse. There's a, there's a PM increase of like 68 seconds, which I know is, that's the increase in the PM at Newland Street. And it increases the 95Q, the length of 36 feet. 36 feet is about two cars. Two cars? Two cars length. Okay. Less than 30, two cars. 38 seconds is usually... Uh, sometimes the level of service could be a little bit misleading. You can be a level of service B, and you add a couple of seconds, just a couple of seconds of the delay, depending on the, the, in, the section of the interval that you are, and then you fall into level of service C. Um, so... Sometimes when you're looking into level service that already be, you see, it's more useful to look into what is the differential. Uh, the ones that you pointed out about the AM on level service F between no build and build, the increase is only six seconds. So the impact, even though it's level service F, the impact is not significant. Um, similarly, from E to F, the increase in the delay is only 11.4 seconds, and that's average delay. It doesn't mean that every single car will have that delay. It's just what, what about the you PM would. increase of 68 seconds? Uh, I could check on that, but mm, the way that when we reviewed the, the information you provided, and we, we got it um, in, with short window. We identify only 11.4 seconds, but we can double check on that to confirm that uh, that differential. Um, I know we talked about Birch Street and we, we waved it. And I just happened, to, I drove by it, uh, and I just wanted to bring to the board's attention uh, and, and ask you know, whether it makes a difference in terms of what it is. That, that street is on an angle. It angles heading south. And literally, I, I just, I rode there, and literally that, that day there was an accident at that corner. Uh, the sight lines are awful. I think I included some pictures of the sight. I don't know if you had the pictures of the sight lines. And I just don't know whether that makes a difference. I don't know what the numbers are. But I just wanted to make sure that we were aware that uh, that's a little bit more problematic. I think it's 66, um, uh, 66 cars going one way, 33 going the other. If you're making that left-hand turn, that's 100 cars over that period of time. And that's an area, again, I, I tracked, I guess I got some information on the, on the amount of accidents there. And I don't know whether that is something that will change our consideration or whether that's something uh, you guys recommend that we address in some other fashion. Um, most of the time when um, problems have been identified in a, in a specific location, depending on the level of impact, the town municipality could decide on the level of mitigation that would be provided. As it was discussed earlier, the expected traffic that is going north of Leonard Street or east of Leonard Street um, is not expected to be that significant to the a geometric configuration that is already existing. Um, with that said, um, at, as you noted on the, on the letter that you sent, I took a ride on that location to observe the side distance. It is not um, without doing an actual measure, I cannot tell you if it meets or not the, the Ashtok Islands. But one thing that I notice is that there is no warning for drivers on 123 that there is an intersection there. There are several driveways and other streets that are intersecting 123 between Bird Street and Leonard. And all of those, there is some 
cues for the driver to notice that there is an intersection, that there is something different. There's uh, left turn lanes that have been provided. So when you're driving in one direction, you see that the double yellow is widening. So that is giving you a cue that there is an intersection coming up there. Uh, so in situations like this, unless there is a crash analysis that is performed at that location, um, we feel that uh, stagger approach on how to address safety at that location could be appropriate. Uh, my, our recommendation, without getting a lot more information, would be to install warning signs in advance of Bird Street, telling drivers on 123 that there is an intersection coming up. And that's something that uh, is uh, <coughs> recent on the most uh, uh, in the most recent MUTCD recommends you to have those kind of warning signs, especially in an area where you don't expect to have a, a side street coming up. Uh, so that will raise the awareness on drivers on 123 of that intersection. That would be something for the Board of Selectmen perhaps to look at at some... Well, it's a state highway, so mass... Is DOT. it at that point? Uh, I believe or it is. Or is it Norton? I forget where it changes. I, I think all of 123 is... There's highway. a portion that... Once it, I think it, once it gets past a certain point, the town has jurisdiction over it because we've discussed it in relation to the town yeah, center. Maybe right. But I, I know look. Uh, Bob Kimball was very aware of where that delineation is. So. Okay. Um, <clears throat> we talked briefly about the, the crash rates. Um, I, I just noted, uh, I didn't get any, uh, that the crash rate for East Main Street in one, 140 is 20, 28 for five years. Is that at what point? At what at what point do we reach a critical mass in terms of evaluating crash crash rates? I, I don't know. Is yeah, no, I, I understand. <clears throat> um, without getting too technical into what a safety analysis includes, um, one crash at one location may be significant compared to one crash at a different location. Um, so in order to have um, on bias analysis, not only you take into account the number of crashes, but also the number of vehicles that, that, use, that are used in that intersection. Um, so let's say that you have an intersection where you have 10 crashes in a year, but you have a million vehicles used in that intersection. The ratio is going to be lower than those same 10 crashes in a location where you only have 10,000 vehicles in a year. Um, the crash rate was calculated in the report, and as noted, the locations um, are under the average of a, an intersection of this type for Mass DOT District 5 as well as for the state. Um, when you compare those <coughs> crash, num crash rate numbers of a specific location versus what is occurring statewide or district-wide um, on intersections that are similar, and if that number tends to be higher, uh, then you have a safety concern and you may want to look as an agency, either a DOT or, as, or a municipality, you want to see into what other um, changes you can implement to increase the safety of that location. The only intersection that there was in five, I don't remember, if I remember correctly, is Washington Street. Yeah, but that was unlighted. Now it's going to be lighted, isn't it? Correct. So right. even though there is already, uh, that's the only location in the whole study area that has a higher than average uh, crash rate. And that's already being addressed by Mass DOT. Right. Uh, the rest of the intersections, even though there are crashes, and uh, and, and I mean, and this is awful uh, to say because one crash for one person is a terrible situation. But it just in terms of statistically purposes, uh, none of the locations that were studied have a significant uh, safety uh, concern from the safety analysis that was done by the applicant and, and that was uh, reviewed and approved by Mass DOT under the MIPA process. Okay, um, but uh, I, I, again, just going back for a second to the, the 123 and uh, uh, Leonard Street, I I'm, I'm still don't know whether or not they were just looking at that one location as opposed to looking at, obviously, the Dunkin' Donuts. And you said we're still, there's another 20, 29 on top of what was there. But we, again, I, I, I realize we don't know what the nature of those accidents were. Correct. Okay. Um, the only other question I, I, I would ask, get, given what we have, um, uh, is there anything beyond the specifics that you would suggest for the applicant and for us that could be done to address um, 
the issues that we're looking at. The only thing that I could see is improving operations on Leonard Street. Uh, if no land restrictions were uh, present for the study the roundabout or additional lanes on Leonard Street to improve the level of service of the intersection, most of the traffic that is coming in and out of the site is going through Leonard Street to 495. Uh, Masiot is already implementing um, mitigation at those locations. Uh, other than that, I, in my opinion, I feel that the applicant has done a due diligence on the on mitigation of the in potential impacts of traffic that uh, would be generated by, from the site. Uh, there are a couple of minor things, but all of them could be addressed during the design process of the of the signal if the signal happens to be implemented at Leonard Street. But um, on our review, uh, the recommendation was the, uh, the reports were prepared following the uh, accepted traffic engineering standards. So. They have done their due diligence on our point of view. And the, other than that specific location, we don't see anything else that is um, with red flags that, that, that uh, would have a potential impact on, on the roadways on, on Norton. Thank you. Other members of the board? Questions? Anyone in the audience? We've had preliminary planning meetings with MassDOT, and we <coughs> feel um, the permits will be complete prior to construction of the other permits at the interchange. So, three to six months. Well, the, the light is being funded privately, so it's not it's not a state funding requirement. So, that we're it's we're st it's a state approval, and and we already have meetings set up and and discussions with them on timing as well. Well, I would ask so. the planning board, how long has the town had approvals and waited for those lights at four hundred five? Here again, it's not. It, there is a huge difference when it's privately funded. I've seen lights approved. I can point to Route 1 and 495 in Plainville. Mm -hmm. Those were approved and up within three months. Because of the, the right. Private funding. Yeah. But what if they don't proceed with the one on 495? We understand that's still a year off on 495. So I, you just, I, you I can't do anything for Mass DOT. I know. So we can control the light that we're responsible for in the mitigation that we're provided for the development in the park that we're developing. What what Mass Highway and Mass DOT in the state does, that's up to them and their timing. I know, but concern is the impact of this project in the absence of the light at 495. God bless people trying to get off Route 1 and get to 495. Because <coughs> They're, they're supposed to construct it and install it in 2019. That's what we know. Okay. Well, I think it's a good thing. I think it's needed, no doubt. That's but it's been needed since 495. Right, <laughs> right. It's a on 495, it doesn't have lights. Mm -hmm. And so that's the concern. And we're, and we're glad they're doing it, too. I so I think it's great. Other questions either from the board or in the audience? Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Francisco. Uh, 
at, at this juncture, I guess for tonight we're done. Um, there are still issues in terms of flood zones, and <coughs> conservation, and the like. But uh, could we generally discuss a couple of topics? Absolutely. No, I, I didn't mean to cut you short. I thought you made your point, but go ahead. I'll join you. Um, so we did receive an additional comment letter today regarding um, the. Horsley and Witten Group did um, additional review re with respect to the open space uh, recreation plan, with respect to um, some of the other zoning bylaws, Norton zoning bylaws. Um, and uh, one item that is a concern is the, the new 2017 to 20. 24 open space and recreation plan, um, which we, we again we just received comments today, but we're trying to determine when that was approved or if it was approved through a vote with the town. We do have a a letter from the environmental um, uh, the MEPA agency basically saying it was approved in July um, for purposes of grant purposes, July of 18. Um, which is after all our MEPA submittals. And basically the comments are saying that we need to adhere by this newest open space recreation plan, which has new goals set forth in it. Um, section eight, a goal, um, objective A of this entire open space plan, again, this is a new plan that's just been approved back in July of this year, is preserve the Houghton farm. Um, <laughs> we have a concer concern with this yes. <laughs> brand new open space. And, and then section nine, action plan for 2017, 2024, in years one, two, three, or one through three, action one of this entire plan, this 300 page document, action one is pre preserve and protect Houghton Farm. Um, we have, you know, <laughs> so we're, we're just, questioning timing issues and just making sure, um, and even a further item, there's an appendix A, which is uh, unavailable on where everything else can download um, with, with check boxes. And um, if you, number one, if you meet one of these requirements, if you're an action item or if you're a goal, then you need to uh, go towards uh, stec section two which, op which has open space impacts, and it states the, the proposed project needs to provide a minimum of 30% of the locus space as open space, um, and further defines 35% consists of upland, non-wetland, non-floodplain, and includes the minimum 25-foot, um, and this open space needs to be restricted, um, deed-restricted land, uh, again, it's coincidental, the timing of this and the wording, uh, you know, we're just very concerned of this, this open space and how it affects this proposal. Um, you know, whether or not we even have to abide by it based on timing. The, yeah. the MEPA open space document was dated on September 5th of 2018. Our MEPAs was well fired, our annual town meetings, the rezoning of industrial, all happened well prior to the acceptance in August, and then the MEPA was added on in September 5th. Uh, in addition, that open space and recreational uses are not allowed in an industrial zone. So this whole land is zoned industrial, and those two uses are not allowed in this area. So in the interim, I mean, we'd love to give the 20 acres of the conservation, the, the wetlands to the town. We'd love to give the town access to the river. We have, you know, proposed sidewalks, walking paths. According to the zoning and according to that, we have conflicting goals that's happening. So this is between the two that I think that needs to be straightened out. Well, let me just speak as a member. Um, the open space plan was approved uh, by town meeting, but so was the rezoning. Um, and I think if you were to ask people in the audience at both town meetings, the details of what they were approving wouldn't have um, nearly a clue in terms of the specifics of the open 
space plant versus what they were approving when they approved the rezoning. I think people spoke loud and clear in terms of the rezoning. That, as far as this planning board member, is the will of the town of Norton. So <clears throat> I have no issue with this. Um, as far as I'm concerned, town rezoned it. Town rezoned it with a specific purpose, and I don't care personally if it conflicts with the open space plan. If they want to, if the town of Norton wants to preserve and protect the Houghton Farm, give them an option to buy it. They turned it down. They were given the option. Right. That's my point. Right. The, the other comments throughout the letter, um, parking numbers, uh, we plan to just uh, make sure all that's squared away. We've kind of already discussed that. Um, movement of earth materials, um, it's a net import site, so we don't feel, um, I've, always, I've always interpreted that bylaw to um, reflect a, like a, a mining operation, like a, an earth removal operation. They use operation through this whole process. So I've always considered that as being the intent of that bylaw, but nonetheless, um, our site is an import site, so we're not removing 500 cubic yards. So I, I will we'll answer that um, concern. Right. And, and we looked into it, and right, if you're not removing that, then we wouldn't... Um, we're we continuing to... Lied to you. Yeah, we're continuing to work through the flood, floodplain information, uh, site plan, uh, landscaping, um, that'll all be a part of the full resubmittal we're planning to do in the next day or so, um, lighting. So we'll, we'll address these. And lastly, we have been working through comments. Um, we've pro we're providing some subsurface infiltration up at buildings one, two, and three, which are reducing the basin and the work in the floodplain. Um, we're providing management uh, plans for all this open space that does exist. We're up to almost 17 acres of this property that's heavily used right now. I mean, it looks like a, especially the golf driving range. Um, golf is not very environmentally friendly, especially a massive driving range like this. There, the entire 16 acres has been irrigated over the years, fertilized over the years. Uh, there's septic systems. Um, there are so many lights when this thing was operated at night. Um, energy, I, I haven't done a computation, but potentially our development is going to use less energy than this thing. And, and as well as there's golf balls everywhere, uh, <laughs> 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 including the river. Um, you know, it's part of the narrative that we're responding to conservation and will be concluded um, is impacts of the existing property as well. Because, we, I mean, the focus is on our impacts. Um, I feel it's going to be um, very easy to show almost a reduced impact uh, from what that golf driving range has been doing. Um, and we're up to, like I said, about 16, 17 acres um, that you know, we're going to provide habitat. We're going to provide a management plan. Um, remove lights off posts, leave some posts with perches on them for birds and things like that down at the bottom of the site. Um, we're going to stop pumping water directly out of the river for irrigation. Um, we're working, <coughs> potentially working on some roof, roof runoff collection systems in combination of maybe a single well that'll um, assist in the low period. But right now, there's, uh, we walked the site this Saturday with conservation and they witnessed the infrastructure to pump the water out of the river directly for irrigation and things like that. So we're continuing to um, respond to the questions as well as um, generally reduce our, basically our limit of development uh, will be re reduced on the final set of plans. That's all I have. Okay. Questions, comments? Uh, Continue this to our next meeting. I'm s yeah, but uh, our next meeting is what December eighteenth. Yes. Any eighteenth? Uh, <clears throat> are we anticipating uh, review in terms of flood? 
Plain and uh, uh, from Horsley Witten. And will we have that by the 18th? Well, yeah, we're trying to resubmit, um, hopefully by tomorrow. So we're, I was hoping today, but uh, we're trying to resubmit two weeks in advance. So. Right. And Horsley's been <clears throat> turning the reviews around um, fairly quickly, in fact, quicker than what we had laid out in the contract. So the, the sooner we get it, the better the likelihood they'll have it. Um, so if uh, you feel you're, you'll be prepared for the 18th, we can continue this uh, to December 18th. Is there a motion to that effect? So moved. Is there a second? All in favor of continuing the uh, public hearing on the site plan and the special permits to uh, December 18th, say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? It's unanimous. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, um, I think that concludes our business, unless uh, we, we had minutes, but uh, do we want to put them off and give... I do have on the minutes. Okay. One of the motions does not have a second listed, so we may yeah. want to go to the tape for that before we approve the video review the way of analysis of Bird oh Street. that was steve steve seconded oh, i made the motion which steve not you the other <laughs> one <laughs> okay he seconded it even though we're not using tape i know that's okay. Um, I haven't reviewed this. Can we hold that off to the next meeting? Certainly. That's why I asked. Uh, yeah, I haven't There's read, no I haven't urgency. Yeah. yeah. All right. Sure. Well, can, him, can we ask uh, if to start getting some meeting dates? Well, that's right. You had asked about uh, after January 1. Right. As we get, if we get any applications in right now, they wouldn't, it would be too late to get on the 18th. And I'd really like to have at least through you know, a few months so we can plan ahead and make sure we can we know when applicants come in when they can uh, when we can schedule them on well, New Year's Day is a Tuesday the first don't want to meet so them. I'd avoid let's that. do that day yeah. no I'm just kidding <laughs> uh, you want to do the 8th and the 22nd uh, for January that seems reasonable 8th and 22nd I won't be able to make the, the 8th I can make the 22nd um, That's fine. I'll, I'll watch the tape. And if we pushed it, we wouldn't have one between the 18th of December and then the 15th of January. Yeah, those, those things don't help me. I'm going to be away. So I leave okay, those days. Okay, so the 15th doesn't help. So, mm -hmm. all right, so we'll stick with the 8th and the uh, eighth and the 22nd? Yeah. Okay. The 22nd is the day after um, Martin, Luther, Martin King. Luther King holiday, if that affects anything. I'm it affects when I have to post the agenda. It's on my calendar, so I mentioned it. That's <laughs> no, it's pretty much the. <laughs> well, that's important because we, as far as agenda postings go, holidays, any national or state holidays, we have we can't count that toward the right. forty-eight Times hours. Posted. Yeah. So when would you need to post? What would uh, be the? It would be the Wednesday, Wednesday before. Wednesday it's not before an issue. We just. The... That, that's an extra special note in your calendar. Yes. Yeah. Right. Um, February. Do we want to go to the uh, run a school vacation? That would be the week of the 18th. The 18th. So okay, yeah, so I'm if we did the if we did two weeks from the 22nd, we'd have the fifth. Right. And then two weeks from that would be President's Day week. Yeah, and again, for what it's worth, although if this isn't wrapped up, I can't miss another meeting. Uh, I am away that week. Of the 18th. Yes. Is it worth going to 12th and 26th for the month of February? Or, or the 5th and the 26th? Either way. <coughs> Again, I just mentioned that having missed one, that's all I'm allowed to miss. Um, so you folks are comfortable with the 5th and the 26th? <coughs> Basically, pretend President's Monday, Day week doesn't happen. Is it this Monday? Is it Tuesdays? 5th and 26th, yeah. They're 26. both Tuesdays. Yeah. Is that what we're going to do? Uh, that makes sense to me for now. Okay. So, again, February 
25th and 25th, 26th. And February 26th, okay. And how much further do you want to go on? March? <clears throat> Two weeks would be the 12th. Well, 12th and the 26th? The 12th and the 26th at that point. When's the next uh, town meeting? <laughs> There's one in January. January. January 14th. Yep, January 14th. Are the um, proposed solar from on the Greenberry box off Bay Road? January. January no, it's it's more than that. What? We'll talk later. Ah! Okay. And uh, uh, what's the next time? When's elections? Eight. Is it eight? So we had March twelfth and was it March? March twelfth and twenty sixth. Okay. And uh, do you want to do April or? Well, one of the ten elections. I think maybe hold I, off. I, that's why I can't I, remember. I, I that's probably hold off. off at this point. I'm going okay. that okay. far out, but we'll we'll get these on your calendar. Very soon. Kind of elections in April? Yeah. Probably. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. so we can't do that anyway. Do we have elections? Well, I mean, You're probably I don't know what it is. Yeah, Warren and I would have to go back to Vegas. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So you definitely care about those elections. Okay, so we have uh, three months worth of meetings. That's enough to keep That's us up at night. <laughs> uh, any other business to attend to? If there is none. Um, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Motion and second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Thank you and good night. Give me the gavel, Joe.